Hello, this is Peter Carter. This is my first video from the UN COP26 that's occurring in Glasgow. This video for the Climate Emergency Institute. It has content from the opening plenary which happened on the 1st of November 2021. Uh, this is a much shortened version of the United Nations video. It's extracts from the speeches. First, for uh, some essential background, this is from a press release from the United Nations on the 25th of October 2021 and it reports on the updated NDC synthesis report by the Climate Secretariat which was published on the 17th of September 2021. NDC being nationally determined contributions which means the government's national emissions targets as filed with the UN Climate Secretariat. The quote is from the Climate Secretariat head, Patricia Espinosa, who said that parties must urgently redouble their climate efforts if they are to prevent temperature increases beyond the goals of the Paris Agreement. She said that overshooting the temperature goals will lead to a destabilized world and endless suffering. Uh, this was an expression that was uh, repeated by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The updated report, she said, confirms the trend, which is that we are nowhere near where the science says we should be. In fact, the uh, synthesis reported that the national emissions targets actually add up to a 16% increase in global emissions by 2030 and we all know from the IPCC that they have to be a 50% decrease by 2030 compared to 2020. It's an honor to speak to you today for the first time as COP president. I'm very aware of the responsibility placed upon me in this role and I do not underestimate the challenge. And the IPCC report in August was a wake-up call for all of us. It made clear that the lights are flashing red on the climate dashboard. That report, agreed by 195 governments, makes clear that human activity is unequivocally the cause of global warming. And we know that the window to keep 1.5 degrees within reach is closing. It is now my pleasure to invite Ms. Patricia Espinoza, UNFCCC Executive Secretary, to address the plenary. Honorable guests, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as Scottish poet Robert Burns once wrote, now is the day, now is the hour. Colleagues, dear friends, we stand at a pivotal point in history. Humanity faces stark but clear choices. We either choose to achieve rapid and large-scale reductions of emissions to keep the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, or we accept that humanity faces a bleak future on this planet. We either choose to recognize that business as usual is not worth the devastating price we're paying and make the necessary transition to, more, to a more sustainable future, or we accept that we are investing in our own extinction. The recently updated UN Climate Change NDC synthesis report showed that emissions continue to rise. That's the bad news. But the truth is that we need even more ambitions and all nations on board, especially the highest emitters in the G20, responsible for around 80% of global emissions. We also need to see provision of support to developing countries, another cornerstone of the Paris Agreen Agreement. This relates to the commitment to mobilize 100 billion from developed countries to developing countries. But let us be clear, without the necessary support, we will not be able to embark 
on the transformations needed to achieve the 1.5 degree goal. This is not only about 100 billion. We need to mobilize the trillions. Success is possible because we have the science. The data is unequivocal. Climate change is widespread, rapid, intensifying, and already impacting every region on Earth, on land, and in the ocean. But one number stands out above all others. We must limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. The IPCC, the NDC Synthesis Report, and the Emissions Gap Report all tell us, however, that we are not on that path. I call upon all parties to use science to inform their decisions at COP26 and act upon it. Studies and statistics tell one story. But we must look beyond the numbers to the human lives they represent. I have been uh, to the small island states threatened by rising waters. I have talked to school children frightened for their futures. I have talked to women who bear the burden of climate change at home, but are shut out of the search for solutions the minute they go out of the door. I have talked to youth frustrated with what they see as a bleak future. The message they all have in common is this. They want to be included. They are right. If we are sincere in calling climate change a global issue, then total inclusion must be the foundation upon which this process is built. Dear colleagues, the transition that we need is beyond the scope scale and speed of anything humanity has accomplished in the past. Let ours be an era defined by the prosperity of the many rather than the short-term gain of the few. Let ours be an era in which we have healthier relationships with nature. Let ours be an era in which we protect our land, oceans, and biodiversity. Let us rise to the enormous challenge of our time, this pivotal point in history, and achieve success for not just our present generation, but all generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Executive Secretary. Uh, the IPCC is currently in the process of preparing its sixth assessment report and has recently uh, released Working Group 1's contribution to that assessment. I would therefore like to invite Mr. Hoisung Lee, Chair of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, to address the plenary. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to address you on behalf of the IPCC at the opening of the COP26. First, our sincere thanks to the UNFCCC Secretariat and the UK government for the successful preparation of this landmark conference. We are equally grateful to the Scottish government and City of Glasgow for this preparation and warm welcome. Prior to this conference, the IPCC released in August the first part of its ongoing sixth assessment uh, report. It clearly laid out for the policymakers and stakeholders the most up-to-date physical science basis for the understanding of the climate system and climate change. Make no mistake, it's a sobering read. It reflects the magnitude of the collective challenge for all nations on this planet. Science shows that changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and becoming more intense and affecting every part of the region. Thanks to major advance in science since our previous assessment report in 2013, today we have a much more precise and clearer picture 
of how the climate system works, which let us understand better what has changed in the, climate, in the past and what is changing now and what can be the changes in the future on the climate system and why they matter for every region. It is now unequivocal that human influence is causing climate change, making extreme events more fr frequent and more severe. Some recent hot extremes, such as heat waves, in the last 10 years would have been extremely unlikely to occur without human influence on the climate system. Global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeded during this century unless immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, especially the carbon dioxide and methane, occur in the nearest future. We also bring a wealth of understanding about climate change at the regional level, which is critically relevant for shaping policies. I encourage everyone to seize the moment, seize the opportunity this gathering offers. We, the scientific community, are ready to work with you on the standing of scientific evidence of climate change, its impacts, adaptations, and how these translate into realities of climate action. We share one atmosphere, one climate system. It knows no borders. The true measure of the effectiveness of our collective efforts will be the state of its condition. And science will attest to that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. It is now my pleasure to invite His Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdullah Shahid, President of the United Nations General Assembly, to address the plenary. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to be candid, for you are family. We are facing an existential crisis. We have the capacity and resources to address this crisis, but we are simply not doing enough. We must be honest about this with ourselves, with each other, and with the rest of the world. We have had decades to argue the facts about climate change, but the power of renewables, about the fine details of monitoring or cost sharing. Yet, we have still failed to act with the conviction and determination required. That may be a hard truth, but it is the truth. Another truth, we are entirely capable of turning this around if we so choose. Excellencies, since assuming the role of the President of the General Assembly, I've heard more about climate change than any other subject. I heard it from every single world leader and delegate at the high level week. I heard it on my travels from youth, from civil society, from local leaders, and from women's groups. I heard it last Tuesday at the General Assembly meeting on climate change that I convened ahead of COP26. While the intensity of their tones varied, their messages were one and the same. The urgency of keeping with 1.5 degrees target, the need to support vulnerable populations, the irresponsibility of not capitalizing on te technological innovations, and the importance of empowering women and youth. I promised the membership of the General Assembly that I would bring this message to here, to Glasgow. First, renewable technologies are now among the cheapest on the planet and command strong public support with the news that climate finance will not reach the promised goal of 100 billion annually until 2023. We must accelerate our efforts to ensure that all countries have access to the latest technological innovations. Second, nearly $100 trillion have been pledged 
to net zero targets by the private sector. Yet, it is unclear how they will be utilized, prioritized, or measured. It is imperative that their contributions are as efficient and impactful as possible. Third, we must maintain focus on adaptation, particularly for vulnerable countries. We must ensure there is an even 50-50 split in adaptation and mitigation financing. Fourth, green jobs are the future, promising both economic prosperity and environmental sustainability. We owe to the world's almost 1.8 billion youth to not only make the transition to blue and green economies, but to also invest in their skills and tap into their energies to make that transition viable. Excellencies, six years ago in Paris, we celebrated an agreement that committed us to keeping global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees. We pledged to protect those most vulnerable, and we acknowledged that this was a planetary problem that no country could go alone. Yet since Paris, it has rained for the first time on Greenland summit. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has reached record levels. Heat waves have scorched countries around the world. Droughts, storms, forest fires, and floods have all become more intense, more recurrent, and more commonplace. And sea levels are rising, threatening small island states and coastal communities alike. My friends, we have the science, we have the resources, we agree on the urgency. What then is holding us back? My dear friends, only one variable remains, and it is us. We have to make the choice to address climate change. We have to choose the hard but necessary actions. We have to listen to the science and increasingly our global population who are demanding action. My dear, dear friends, we have run out of excuses. It is time to do the right thing. In the words of Frankie the Dinos, the dinosaur who addressed the General Assembly, let us not choose extinction. Let us work together as one global family and use the capacities and capabilities at hand to do what needs to be done. Let us get it done. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency. Um, now, upon my special invitation, it is my pleasure to invite India Logan Riley, a representative of the indigenous peoples, to address the plenary. Tina Tato Katoa. Hello, everyone. Ko Kahuraniki, Te Maunga, Ko Tukituki Te Awa, Ko Ngarururo Te Awa, Ko Tutaikuri Te Awa, Ko Ngat Kangunu Te Iwi, Tihei Moriora, Ko India Middle Logan Riley Aho. My name is India, and I am from a nation called Ngat Kangunu on the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, colonially known as New Zealand. In February of last year, catastrophic climate change-filled wildfires tore their way across eastern Australia. The smoke cloud was so big that the sun turned red in my own homelands, far from the east coast of Australia. At that time, I was supporting my younger brother in hospital, and the doctors told us that they were seeing higher amounts of people with breathing issues related to the smoke in the air. In that moment, our health was bound to the struggle of the land and people in another country. In the impacts of climate change, our fates are intertwined, as are the historic forces that have brought us together today. Before we embark on these two weeks of negotiations, it is important to reflect on how we ended up in this room, with thousands of other people masked up and poised to deliberate. And to do this, I must go back hundreds of years into the roots of imperialist expansion and the story of my own community. 252 years ago, invading forces sent by the ancestors of this presidency arrived in my ancestors' territories, heralding an age of violence and murder and destruction enabled by documents like the Do Doctrine of Discovery that were formulated in Europe. 
Land in my region was stolen by the British Crown in order to extract oil and suck the land of all its nutrients while seeking to displace my people and end our practices. The first time I personally experienced these violent processes was at 10 years old, when the local council attempted to steal our community's land for the construction of a highway. And then after that, the New Zealand government stole the foreshore and seabed and offered it up for deep sea oil drilling the following year. These historic forces continue to shape my life and have brought me here. I have grown up in these negotiations, spending my 20s running through these halls, lobbying decision makers and staying up far past midnight hand stitching banners. Since my first climate talks in Paris, I've been giving the same speech. I've been applauded and awarded for conjuring emotive imagery of rising sea levels and yearly wildfires that my community continues to endure. Six years ago, I first spoke these stories into this space, and every year since, I have repeated the same words, wildfires, sea level rise, wildfires, suffering, sea level rise, biodiversity loss, sea level rise. Emissions continue to rise. I'm the same age as these negotiations. I've grown up, graduated, fallen in love, fallen out of love, stopped and changed a couple of careers along the way, all while the global north, colonial governments and corporations fudge with the future. And as indigenous, sorry, knowing that this history shows us that hands and minds made this present world, and so it is also hands and hearts and minds that can remake it. And it is indigenous and frontline communities that are leading this remaking. We're keeping fossil fuels in the ground and stopping fossil fuel expansion. We're halting infrastructure that would increase emissions and saying no to false solutions. In fact, in the US and Canada alone, indigenous resi resistance has stopped or delayed greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to at least one quarter of annual emissions. What we do works. In the face of mediocre leadership, indigenous peoples shine through. This is all to say that climate change is the final outcome of the colonial project. And in our response, we must be decolonial, rooted in justice and care for communities like mine who have borne the burden of the global north greed for far too long. I cannot put it more simply that, than that we know what we are doing. And if you aren't willing to back us, or let us lead, then you're complicit in the death and destruction that is happening across the globe. Rights frameworks must be entrenched in the Paris rulebook. Finance must be redistributed from the likes of war games in the Pacific towards loss and damage and a just transition. And richer countries have to commit, commit to steep tr emissions reductions this decade, rather than palming off responsibility through carbon markets. And last but not least, land back oceans back. This is all part of following indigenous leadership. This is what keeping warming below 1.5 degrees looks like. This is an invitation to you. This COP, learn our histories, listen to our stories, honour our knowledge, and get in line or get out of the way. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, India. Excellencies, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, brings us to the end of the opening statements of COP26.